Morning and Evening Devotional by Charles Haddon Spurgeon Morning, May 1st Song of Solomon, chapter 5, verse 13 His cheeks are like beds of spice, towers of perfume. His lips are like lilies, dripping with flowing myrrh. Lo, the flowery month is come. March winds and April showers have done their work, and the earth is all bedecked with beauty. Come, my soul, put on thine holiday attire, and go forth to gather garlands of heavenly thoughts. Thou knowest whither to betake thyself, for to thee the beds of spices are well known, and thou hast so often smelt the perfume of the sweet flowers, that thou wilt go at once to thy well-beloved, and find all loveliness, all joy in him. That cheek, once so rudely smitten with a rod, oft bedewed with tears of sympathy, and then defiled with spittle. That cheek, as it smiles with mercy, is as fragrant aromatic to my heart. Thou didst not hide thy face from shame and spitting, O Lord Jesus, and therefore I will find my dearest delight in praising thee. Those cheeks were furrowed by the plough of grief, and crimsoned with red lines of blood from thy thorn-crowned temples. Such marks of love unbounded cannot but charm my soul far more than pillars of perfume. If I may not see the whole of his face, I would behold his cheeks, for the least glimpse of him is exceedingly refreshing to my spiritual sense, and yields a variety of delights. In Jesus I find not only fragrance, but a bed of spices, not one flower, but all manner of sweet flowers. He is to me my rose and my lily, my heart sees and my cluster of camphire. When he is with me it is May all the year round, and my soul goes forth to wash her happy face in the morning dew of his grace, and to solace herself with the singing of the birds of his promises. Precious Lord Jesus, let me in very deed know the blessedness which dwells in abiding, unbroken fellowship with Thee. I am a poor, worthless one, whose cheek Thou hast deigned to kiss. Oh, let me kiss Thee in return, with the kisses of my lips. Morning and Evening Devotional by Charles Haddon Spurgeon Evening, May 1st Song of Solomon, Chapter 2, Verse 1 I am a rose of Sharon, a lily of the valley. Whatever there may be of beauty in the material world, Jesus Christ possesses all that in the spiritual world in a tenfold degree. Amongst flowers, the rose is deemed the sweetest, but Jesus is infinitely more beautiful in the garden of the soul than the rose can be in the gardens of earth. He takes the first place as the fairest among ten thousand. He is the sun, and all others are the stars. The heavens and the day are dark in comparison with him, for the king in his beauty transcends all. I am the Rose of Sharon. This was the best and rarest of roses. Jesus is not the rose alone, he is the Rose of Sharon, just as he calls his righteousness gold, and then adds, the gold of Ophir, the best of the best. He is positively lovely and superlatively the loveliest. There is variety in his charms. The rose is delightful to the eye, and its scent is pleasant and refreshing. So each of the senses of the soul, whether it be the taste or feeling, the hearing, the sight, or the spiritual smell, finds appropriate gratification in Jesus. Even the recollection of his love is sweet. Take the rose of Sharon, and pull it leaf from leaf, and lay by the leaves in the jar of memory. And you shall find each leaf fragrant long afterwards, filling the house with perfume. Christ satisfies the highest taste of the most educated spirit to the very full. The greatest amateur in perfumes is quite satisfied with the rose. And when the soul has arrived at her highest pitch of true taste, she shall still be content with Christ, nay, she shall be the better able to appreciate him. Heaven itself possesses nothing which excels the rose of Sharon.
What emblem can fully set forth his beauty? Human speech and earth-born things fail to tell of him. Earth's choicest charms commingled feebly picture his abounding preciousness. Blessed rose, bloom in my heart forever. Morning and Evening Devotional by Charles Haddon Spurgeon Morning, May 2nd to John chapter 17 verse 15 I am not asking that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. It is a sweet and blessed event which will occur to all believers in God's own time, the going home to be with Jesus. In a few more years, the Lord's soldiers, who are now fighting the good fight of faith, will have done with conflict and have entered into the joy of their Lord. But although Christ prays that His people may eventually be with Him where He is, He does not ask that they may be taken at once away from this world to heaven. He wishes them to stay here. Yet, how frequently does the wearied pilgrim put up the prayer, Oh, that I had wings like a dove, for then would I fly away and be at rest. But Christ does not pray like that. He leaves us in His Father's hands until, like shocks of corn, fully ripe, we shall each be gathered into our Master's garner. Jesus does not plead for our instant removal by death, for to abide in the flesh is needful for others, if not profitable for ourselves. He asks that we may be kept from evil, but He never asks for us to be admitted to the inheritance in glory till we are of full age. Christians often want to die when they have any trouble. Ask them why, and they tell you, because we would be with the Lord. We fear it is not so much because they are longing to be with the Lord, as because they desire to get rid of their troubles. Else they would feel the same wish, to die at other times, when not under the pressure of trial. They want to go home, not so much for the Savior's company, as to be at rest. Now it is quite right to desire to depart if we can do it in the same spirit that Paul did, because to be with Christ is far better, but the wish to escape from trouble is a selfish one. Rather let your care and wish be to glorify God by your life here as long as He pleases, even though it be in the midst of toil and conflict and suffering, and leave Him to say when it is enough. Morning and Evening Devotional by Charles Haddon Spurgeon Evening, May the 2nd Hebrews chapter 11 verse 13 All these people died in faith, without having received the things they were promised. However, they saw them and welcomed them from afar, and they acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. Behold the epitaph of all those blessed saints who fell asleep before the coming of our Lord. It matters nothing how else they died, whether of old age or by violent means. This one point, in which they all agree, is the most worthy of record. They all died in faith. In faith they lived. It was their comfort, their guide, their motive, and their support. And in the same spiritual grace they died, ending their life song in the sweet strain in which they had so long continued. They did not die resting in the flesh or upon their own attainments. They made no advance from their first way of acceptance with God, but held to the way of faith to the end. Faith is as precious to die by as to live by. Dying in faith has distinct reference to the past. They believed the promises which had gone before and were assured that their sins were blotted out through the mercy of God. Dying in faith has to do with the present. These saints were confident of their acceptance with God. They enjoyed the beams of His love and rested in His faithfulness. Dying in faith looks into the future. They fell asleep.
affirming that the Messiah would surely come, and that when he would in the last days appear upon the earth, they would rise from their graves to behold him. To them, the pains of death were but the birth pangs of a better state. Take courage, my soul, as thou readest this epitaph. Thy course through grace is one of faith, and sight seldom cheers thee. This has also been the pathway of the brightest and the best. Faith was the orbit in which these stars of the first magnitude moved all the time of their shining here, and happy art, thou that it is thine. Look anew tonight to Jesus, the author and finisher of thy faith, and thank him for giving thee like precious faith with souls now in glory. Morning and Evening Devotional by Charles Haddon Spurgeon Morning, May the 3rd John chapter 16, verse 33 I have told you these things, so that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take courage. I have overcome the world. Art thou asking the reason of this, believer? Look upward to thy heavenly Father, and behold him pure and holy. Dost thou know that thou art one day to be like him? Wilt thou easily be conformed to his image? Wilt thou not require much refining in the furnace of affliction to purify thee? Will it be an easy thing to get rid of thy corruptions and make thee perfect even as thy Father, which is in heaven, is perfect? Next, Christian, turn thine eye downward. Dost thou know what foes thou hast beneath thy feet? Thou waste once a servant of Satan, and no king will willingly lose his subjects. Dost thou think that Satan will let thee alone? No, he will be always at thee, for he goeth about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Expect trouble, therefore, Christian, when thou lookest beneath thee. Then look around thee. Where art thou? Thou art in an enemy's country, a stranger and a sojourner. The world is not thy friend. If it be, then thou art not God's friend, for he who is the friend of the world is the enemy of God. Be assured that thou shalt find foemen everywhere. When thou sleepest, think that thou art resting on the battlefield. When thou walkest, suspect an ambush in every hedge. As mosquitoes are said to bite strangers more than natives, so will the trials of earth be sharpest to you. Lastly, look within thee into thine own heart, and observe what is there. Sin and self are still within. Ah, if thou hadst no devil to tempt thee, no enemies to fight thee, and no world to ensnare thee, thou wouldst still find in thyself evil enough to be a sore trouble to thee, for the heart is deceitful above all things, and desperately wicked. Expect trouble then, but despond not on account of it, for God is with thee to help and to strengthen thee. He hath said, I will be with thee in trouble. I will deliver thee and honor thee. Morning and Evening Devotional by Charles Haddon Spurgeon Evening May 3rd Psalm 46 verse 1 For the choir master of the sons of Korah, according to Alamoth. A song, God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in times of trouble. Covenant blessings are not meant to be looked at only, but to be appropriated. Even our Lord Jesus is given to us for our present use. Believer, thou dost not make use of Christ as thou oughtest to do. When thou art in trouble, why dost thou not tell him all thy grief? Has he not a sympathizing heart? And can he not comfort and relieve thee? No. Thou art going about to all thy friends, save thy best friend, and telling thy tale everywhere except into the bosom of thy Lord. Art thou burdened with this day's sins? Here is a fountain filled with blood. Use it, saint. Use it. 
has a sense of guilt returned upon thee? The pardoning grace of Jesus may be proved again and again. Come to him at once for cleansing. Dost thou deplore thy weakness? He is thy strength. Why not lean upon him? Dost thou feel naked? Come hither, soul. Put on the robe of Jesus' righteousness. Stand not looking at it, but wear it. Strip off thine own righteousness, and thine own fears too. Put on the fair white linen, for it was meant to wear. Dost thou feel thyself sick? Pull the night bell of prayer, and call up the beloved physician. He will give the cordial that will revive thee. Thou art poor, but then thou hast a kinsman, a mighty man of wealth. What, wilt thou not go to him and ask him to give thee of his abundance, when he has given thee this promise that thou shalt be joint heir with him, and has made over all that he is and all that he has to be thine? There is nothing Christ dislikes more than for his people to make a show thing of him, and not to use him. He loves to be employed by us. The more burdens we put on his shoulders, the more precious will he be to us. Let us be simple with him, then. Not backward, stiff, or cold. As though our Bethlehem could be what Sinai was of old. Morning and Evening Devotional by Charles Haddon Spurgeon Morning, May 4th Jeremiah chapter 16 verse 20 Can man make gods for himself? Such are not gods. One great besetting sin of ancient Israel was idolatry, and the spiritual Israel are vexed with a tendency to the same folly. Remphan's star shines no longer, and the women weep no more for Tammuz. But Mammon still intrudes his golden calf, and the shrines of pride are not forsaken. Self, in various forms, struggles to subdue the chosen ones under its dominion, and the flesh sets up its altars wherever it can find space for them. Favorite children are often the cause of much sin in believers. The Lord is grieved when he sees us doting upon them above measure. They will live to be as great a curse to us as Absalom was to David, or they will be taken from us to leave our homes desolate. If Christians desire to grow thorns, to stuff their sleepless pillows, let them dote on their dear ones. It is truly said that they are no gods, for the objects of our foolish love are very doubtful blessings. The solace which they yield us now is dangerous, and the help which they can give us in the hour of trouble is little indeed. Why then are we so bewitched with vanities? We pity the poor heathen who adore a god of stone, and yet worship a god of gold. Where is the vast superiority between a god of flesh and one of wood? The principle, the sin, the folly is the same in either case, only that in ours the crime is more aggravated because we have more light, and sin in the face of it. The heathen bows to a false deity, but the true God he has never known. We commit two evils, inasmuch as we forsake the living God and turn unto idols. May the Lord purge us all from this grievous iniquity. The dearest idol I have known what a... Whate'er that idol be, help me to tear it from thy throne, and worship only thee. Morning and Evening Devotional by Charles Haddon Spurgeon Evening, May 4th 1 Peter, chapter 1, verse 23 For you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and enduring word of God. Peter most earnestly exhorted the scattered saints to love each other with a pure heart fervently, and he wisely fetched his argument, not from the law, from nature, or from philosophy, but from that high and divine nature which God hath implanted in his people. 
just as some judicious tutor of princes might labor to beget and foster in them a kingly spirit and dignified behavior, finding arguments in their position and descent. So, looking upon God's people as heirs of glory, princes of the blood royal, descendants of the King of Kings, earth's truest and oldest aristocracy, Peter saith to them, See that ye love one another, because of your noble birth, being born of incorruptible seed, because of your pedigree, being descended from God, the Creator of all things, and because of your immortal destiny, for you shall never pass away, though the glory of the flesh shall fade, and even its existence shall cease. It would be well if, in the spirit of humility, we recognized the true dignity of our regenerated nature and lived up to it. What is a Christian? If you compare him with a king, he adds priestly sanctity to royal dignity. The king's royalty often lieth only in his crown, but with a Christian it is infused into his inmost nature. He is as much above his fellows through his new birth as a man is above the beast that perisheth. Surely he ought to carry himself in all his dealings as one who is not of the multitude, but chosen out of the world, distinguished by sovereign grace, written among the peculiar people, and who therefore cannot grovel in the dust as others, nor live after the manner of the world's citizens. Let the dignity of your nature and the brightness of your prospects, O believers in Christ, constrain you to cleave unto holiness and to avoid the very appearance of evil. Morning and Evening Devotional by Charles Haddon Spurgeon Morning, May 5th 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 16 What agreement can exist between the temple of God and idols? For we are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell with them and walk among them and I will be their God, and they will be my people. What a sweet title, my people! What a cheering revelation, their God! How much of meaning is couched in those two words, my people! Here is speciality. The whole world is God's. The heaven, even the heaven of heavens, is the Lord's, and he reigneth among the children of men. But of those whom he hath chosen, whom he hath purchased to himself. He saith what he saith not of others, my people. In this word there is the idea of proprietorship. In a special manner the Lord's portion is his people. Jacob is the lot of his inheritance. All the nations upon earth are his. The whole world is in his power. Yet are his people, his chosen, more especially his possession. For he has done more for them than others. He has bought them with his blood. He has brought them nigh to himself. He has set his great heart upon them. He has loved them with an everlasting love, a love which many waters cannot quench, and which the revolutions of time shall never suffice in the least degree to diminish. Dear friends, can you, by faith, see yourselves in that number? Can you look up to heaven and say, My Lord and my God, mine by that sweet relationship which entitles me to call thee Father, mine by that hallowed fellowship which I delight to hold with thee, when thou art pleased to manifest thyself unto me as thou dost not unto the world? Canst thou read the book of inspiration and find there the indentures of thy salvation? Canst thou read thy title writ in precious blood? Canst thou, by humble faith, lay hold of Jesus' garments and say, My Christ? If thou canst, then God saith of thee, and of others like thee, My people. For if God be your God, and Christ your Christ, the Lord has a special, peculiar favor to you. You are the object of his choice, accepted in his beloved Son. Morning and Evening Devotional by Charles Haddon Spurgeon Evening, May 5th 
Proverbs chapter 16, verse 20. Whoever heeds instruction will find success, and blessed is he who trusts in the Lord. Wisdom is man's true strength, and, under its guidance, he best accomplishes the ends of his being. Wisely handling the matter of life gives to man the richest enjoyment and presents the noblest occupation for his powers. Hence, by it he finds good in the fullest sense. Without wisdom, man is as the wild ass's colt, running hither and thither, wasting strength which might be profitably employed. Wisdom is the compass by which man is to steer across the trackless waste of life. Without it he is a derelict vessel, the sport of winds and waves. A man must be prudent in such a world as this, or he will find no good, but be betrayed into unnumbered ills. The pilgrim will sorely wound his feet among the briars of the wood of life, if he do not pick his steps with the utmost caution. He who is in a wilderness infested with robber bands must handle matters wisely, if he would journey safely. If, trained by the great teacher, we follow where he leads, we shall find good, even while in this dark abode. There are celestial fruits to be gathered this side of Eden's bowers, and songs of paradise to be sung amid the groves of earth. But where shall this wisdom be found? Many have dreamed of it, but have not possessed it. Where shall we learn it? Let us listen to the voice of the Lord, for he hath declared the secret. He hath revealed to the sons of men wherein true wisdom lieth, and we have it in the text. Whoso trusteth in the Lord, happy is he. The true way to handle a matter wisely is to trust in the Lord. This is the sure clue to the most intricate labyrinths of life. Follow it and find eternal bliss. He who trusts in the Lord has a diploma for wisdom granted by inspiration. Happy is he now, and happier shall he be above. Lord, in this sweet eventide walk with me in the garden and teach me the wisdom of faith. Morning and Evening Devotional by Charles Haddon Spurgeon Morning, May 6th 1 John chapter 4, verse 13 By this we know that we remain in Him, and He in us. He has given us of His Spirit. Do you want a house for your soul? Do you ask, what is the purchase? It is something less than proud human nature will like to give. It is without money and without price. Ah, you would like to pay a respectable rent. You would love to do something to win Christ. Then you cannot have the house, for it is without price. Will you take my master's house on a lease for all eternity, with nothing to pay for it, nothing but the ground rent of loving and serving him forever? Will you take Jesus and dwell in him? See. This house is furnished with all you want. It is filled with riches more than you will spend as long as you live. Here you can have intimate communion with Christ and feast on His love. Here are tables well stored with food for you to live on forever. In it, when weary, you can find rest with Jesus. And from it, you can look out and see heaven itself. Will you have the house? Ah, if you are houseless, you will say, I should like to have the house, but may I have it? Yes, there is the key. The key is, come to Jesus. But you say, I am too shabby for such a house. Never mind, there are garments inside. If you feel guilty and condemned, come. And though the house is too good for you, Christ will make you good enough for the house by and by. He will wash you and cleanse you and you will yet be able to sing, We dwell in Him. Believer thrice, happy art thou to have such a dwelling place. Greatly privileged thou art, for thou hast a strong habitation in which thou art ever safe. And dwelling in Him, thou hast not only a perfect and secure house, but an everlasting one.
When this world shall have melted like a dream, our house shall live, and stand more imperishable than marble, more solid than granite, self-existent as God, for it is God himself. We dwell in him. Morning and Evening Devotional by Charles Haddon Spurgeon Evening, May 6, Job chapter 14, verse 14 When a man dies, will he live again? All the days of my hard service I will wait until my renewal comes. A little stay on earth will make heaven more heavenly. Nothing makes rest so sweet as toil. Nothing renders security so pleasant as exposure to alarms. The bitter quassia cups of earth will give a relish to the new wine which sparkles in the golden bowls of glory. Our battered armor and scarred countenances will render more illustrious our victory above when we are welcomed to the seats of those who have overcome the world. We should not have full fellowship with Christ if we did not for a while sojourn below, for he was baptized with a baptism of suffering among men, and we must be baptized with the same if we would share his kingdom. Fellowship with Christ is so honorable that the sorest sorrow is a light price by which to procure it. Another reason for our lingering here is for the good of others. We would not wish to enter heaven till our work is done, and it may be that we are yet ordained to minister light to souls benighted in the wilderness of sin. Our prolonged stay here is doubtless for God's glory. A tried saint, like a well-cut diamond, glitters much in the king's crown. Nothing reflects so much honor on a workman as a protracted and severe trial of his work, and its triumphant endurance of the ordeal without giving way in any part. We are God's workmanship, in whom he will be glorified by our afflictions. It is for the honor of Jesus that we endure the trial of our faith with sacred joy. Let each man surrender his own longings to the glory of Jesus and feel, if my lying in the dust would elevate my Lord by so much as an inch, let me still lie among the pots of earth. If to live on earth forever would make my Lord more glorious, it should be my heaven to be shut out of heaven. Our time is fixed and settled by eternal decree. Let us not be anxious about it, but wait with patience till the gates of pearl shall open. Morning and Evening Devotional by Charles Haddon Spurgeon Morning, May 7th Matthew chapter 12, verse 15 Aware of this, Jesus withdrew from that place. Large crowds followed him, and he healed them all. What a mass of hideous sickness must have thrust itself under the eye of Jesus. Yet we read not that he was disgusted, but patiently waited on every case. What a singular variety of evils must have met at his feet! What sickening ulcers and putrefying sores! Yet he was ready for every new shape of the monster evil, and was victor over it in every form. Let the arrow fly from what quarter it might. He quenched its fiery power. The heat of fever, or the cold of dropsy, the lethargy of palsy, or the rage of madness, the filth of leprosy, or the darkness of ophthalmia, all knew the power of his word and fled at his command. In every corner of the field he was triumphant over evil and received the homage of delivered captives. He came, he saw, he conquered everywhere. It is even so this morning. Whatever my own case may be, the beloved physician can heal me, and whatever may be the state of others whom I may remember at this moment in prayer, I may have hope in Jesus that he will be able to heal them of their sins. My child, my friend, my dearest one, I can have hope for each, for all, when I remember the healing power of my Lord, and on my own account, However severe my struggle with sins and infirmities, I may yet be of good cheer. He who on earth walked the hospitals still dispenses his grace 
and works wonders among the sons of men. Let me go to him at once, in right earnest. Let me praise him this morning, as I remember how he wrought his spiritual cures, which bring him most renown. It was by taking upon himself our sicknesses. By his stripes we are healed. The church on earth is full of souls healed by our beloved physician, and the inhabitants of heaven itself confess that he healed them all. Come then, my soul, publish abroad the virtue of his grace, and let it be to the Lord for a name, for an everlasting sign, which shall not be cut off. Morning and Evening Devotional by Charles Haddon Spurgeon Evening, May 7th John chapter 5, verse 8 Then Jesus told him, Get up, pick up your mat, and walk. Like many others, the impotent man had been waiting for a wonder to be wrought, and a sign to be given. Wearily did he watch the pool, but no angel came, or came not for him. Yet, thinking it to be his only chance, he waited still, and knew not that there was one near him, whose word could heal him in a moment. Many are in the same plight. They are waiting for some singular emotion, remarkable impression, or celestial vision. They wait in vain, and watch for naught, even supposing that, in a few cases, remarkable signs are seen. Yet these are rare, and no man has a right to look for them in his own case. No man especially who feels his impotency to avail himself of the moving of the water even if it came. It is a very sad reflection that tens of thousands are now waiting in the use of means and ordinances and vows and resolutions, and have so waited time out of mind, in vain, utterly in vain. Meanwhile these poor souls forget the present Saviour, who bids them look unto him and be saved. He could heal them at once, but they prefer to wait for an angel and a wonder. To trust him is the sure way to every blessing, and he is worthy of the most implicit confidence. But unbelief makes them prefer the cold porches of Bethesda to the warm bosom of his love. Oh, that the Lord may turn his eye upon the multitudes who are in this case tonight. May he forgive the slights which they put upon his divine power and call them by that sweet constraining voice to rise from the bed of despair, and in the energy of faith take up their bed and walk. O Lord, hear our prayer for all such at this calm hour of sunset, and ere the day breaketh may they look and live. Courteous reader, is there anything in this portion for you? Morning and Evening Devotional by Charles Haddon Spurgeon Morning, May 8th. John chapter 5, verse 13. But the man who was healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had slipped away while the crowd was there. Years are short to the happy and healthy, but thirty-eight years of disease must have dragged a very weary length along the life of the poor, impotent man. When Jesus therefore healed him by a word, while he lay at the pool of Bethesda, he was delightfully sensible of a change. Even so, the sinner who has for weeks and months been paralyzed with despair and has wearily sighed for salvation is very conscious of the change when the Lord Jesus speaks the word of power and gives joy and peace in believing. The evil removed is too great to be removed without our discerning it. The life imparted is too remarkable to be possessed and remain inoperative, and the change wrought is too marvellous not to be perceived. Yet the poor man was ignorant of the author of his cure. He knew not the sacredness of his person, the offices which he sustained, or the errand which brought him among men. Much ignorance of Jesus may remain in hearts which yet feel the power of his blood. We must not hastily condemn men for lack of knowledge. But where we can see the faith which saves the soul, we must believe that salvation has been bestowed. 
The Holy Spirit makes men penitents long before He makes them divines. And he who believes what he knows shall soon know more clearly what he believes. Ignorance is, however, an evil. For this poor man was much tantalized by the Pharisees and was quite unable to cope with them. It is good to be able to answer gainsayers, but we cannot do so if we know not the Lord Jesus clearly and with understanding. The cure of his ignorance, however, soon followed the cure of his infirmity. For he was visited by the Lord in the temple, and after that gracious manifestation, he was found testifying that it was Jesus who had made him whole. Lord, if thou hast saved me, show me thyself, that I may declare thee to the sons of men. Morning and Evening Devotional by Charles Haddon Spurgeon Evening, May 8th Job, chapter 22, verse 21 Reconcile now, and be at peace with him, thereby good will come to you. If we would rightly acquaint ourselves with God and be at peace, we must know him as he has revealed himself, not only in the unity of his essence and subsistence, but also in the plurality of his persons. God said, Let us make man in our own image. Let not man be content until he knows something of the us from whom his being was derived. Endeavor to know the Father, bury your head in his bosom in deep repentance, and confess that you are not worthy to be called his son. Receive the kiss of his love. Let the ring which is the token of his eternal faithfulness be on your finger. Sit at his table and let your heart make merry in his grace. Then press forward and seek to know much of the Son of God, who is the brightness of his Father's glory, and yet in unspeakable condescension of grace became man for our sakes. Know him in the singular complexity of his nature, eternal God and yet suffering, finite man. Follow him as he walks the waters with the tread of deity and as he sits upon the well in the weariness of humanity. Be not satisfied unless you know much of Jesus Christ as your friend, your brother, your husband, your all. Forget not the Holy Spirit, endeavor to obtain a clear view of his nature and character, his attributes and his works. Behold that Spirit of the Lord, who first of all moved upon chaos and brought forth order, who now visits the chaos of your soul and creates the order of holiness. Behold him as the Lord and giver of spiritual life, the illuminator, the instructor, the comforter, and the sanctifier. Behold him as, like holy unction, he descends upon the head of Jesus, and then afterwards rests upon you, who are as the skirts of his garments. Such an intelligent, scriptural, and experimental belief in the Trinity in unity is yours if you truly know God, and such knowledge brings peace indeed. Morning and Evening Devotional by Charles Haddon Spurgeon Morning, May 9th Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3 Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms. All the goodness of the past, the present, and the future, Christ bestows upon his people. In the mysterious ages of the past, the Lord Jesus was his Father's first elect, and in his election he gave us an interest, for we were chosen in him from before the foundation of the world. He had from all eternity the prerogatives of sonship, as his Father's only begotten and well-beloved Son, and he has, in the riches of his grace, by adoption and regeneration, elevated us to sonship also, so that to us he has given power to become the sons of God. The eternal covenant, based upon seretorship and confirmed by oath, is ours for our strong consolation and security. In the everlasting settlements of predestinating wisdom, and omnipotent decree, 
the eye of the Lord Jesus was ever fixed on us, and we may rest assured that in the whole roll of destiny there is not a line which militates against the interests of his redeemed. The great betrothal of the Prince of Glory is ours, for it is to us that he is affianced, as the sacred nuptials shall ere long declare to an assembled universe. The marvellous incarnation of the God of heaven, with all the amazing condescension and humiliation which attended it, is ours. The bloody sweat, the scourge, the cross, are ours forever. Whatever blissful consequences flow from perfect obedience, finished atonement, resurrection, ascension, or intercession, all are ours by his own gift. Upon his breastplate, he is now bearing our names, and in his authoritative pleadings at the throne, he remembers our persons and pleads our cause. His dominion over principalities and powers, and his absolute majesty in heaven, he employs for the benefit of them who trust in him. His high estate is as much at our service as was his condition of abasement. He who gave himself for us in the depths of woe and death doth not withdraw the grant now that he is enthroned in the highest heavens. Morning and Evening Devotional by Charles Haddon Spurgeon Evening, May 9th Song of Solomon, Chapter 7, Verses 11 and 12 Come, my beloved, let us go to the countryside, let us spend the night among the wild flowers. Let us go early to the vineyards to see if the vine has budded, if the blossom has opened, if the pomegranates are in bloom. There I will give you my love. The church was about to engage in earnest labor and desired her Lord's company in it. She does not say, I will go, but let us go. It is blessed working when Jesus is at our side. It is the business of God's people to be trimmers of God's vines. Like our first parents, we are put into the garden of the Lord for usefulness. Let us therefore go forth into the field. Observe that the church, when she is in her right mind, in all her many labors, desires to enjoy communion with Christ. Some imagine that they cannot serve Christ actively and yet have fellowship with Him they are mistaken. Doubtless it is very easy to fritter away our inward life in outward exercises and come to complain with the spouse. They made me keeper of the vineyards, but mine own vineyard have I not kept. But there is no reason why this should be the case except our own folly and neglect. Certain is it that a professor may do nothing and yet grow quite as lifeless in spiritual things as those who are most busy. Mary was not praised for sitting still, but for her sitting at Jesus' feet. Even so, Christians are not to be praised for neglecting duties under the pretense of having secret fellowship with Jesus. It is not sitting, but sitting at Jesus' feet, which is commendable. Do not think that activity is in itself an evil. It is a great blessing and a means of grace to us. Paul called it a grace given to him to be allowed to preach, and every form of Christian service may become a personal blessing to those engaged in it. Those who have most fellowship with Christ are not recluses or hermits who have much time to spare, but indefatigable laborers who are toiling for Jesus, and who, in their toil, have him side by side with them, so that they are workers together with God. Let us remember then, in anything we have to do for Jesus, that we can do it and should do it in close communion with him. Morning and Evening Devotional by Charles Haddon Spurgeon Morning, May 10th 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 20 but Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the firstfruits of those who have fallen asleep. The whole system of Christianity rests upon the fact that Christ is risen from the dead, for 
If Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain, and your faith is also vain. Ye are yet in your sins. The divinity of Christ finds its surest proof in his resurrection, since he was declared to be the Son of God with power, according to the Spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead. It would not be unreasonable to doubt his deity if he had not risen. Moreover, Christ's sovereignty depends upon his resurrection, for to this end Christ both died and rose and revived, that he might be Lord both of the dead and living. Again, our justification, that choice blessing of the covenant, is linked with Christ's triumphant victory over death and the grave. For he was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. Nay, more, our very regeneration is connected with his resurrection. For we are begotten again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And most certainly, our ultimate resurrection rests here. For if the Spirit of Him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, He that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by His Spirit that dwelleth in you. If Christ be not risen, then shall we not rise. But if He be risen, then they who are asleep in Christ have not perished, but in their flesh shall surely behold their God. Thus, the silver thread of resurrection runs through all the believer's blessings, from his regeneration onwards to his eternal glory, and binds them together. How important then will this glorious fact be in his estimation, and how will he rejoice that beyond a doubt it is established, that now is Christ risen from the dead? The promise is fulfilled. Redemption's work is done. Justice with mercies reconciled. For God has raised His Son. Morning and Evening Devotional by Charles Haddon Spurgeon Evening, May 10th John chapter 1, verse 14 The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only Son from the Father full of grace and truth. Believer, you can bear your testimony that Christ is the only begotten of the Father, as well as the first begotten from the dead. You can say, He is divine to me, if He be human to all the world beside. He has done that for me which none but a God could do. He has subdued my stubborn will, melted a heart of adamant, opened gates of brass, and snapped bars of iron. He hath turned for me my mourning into laughter and my desolation into joy. He hath led my captivity captive and made my heart rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. Let others think as they will of him. To me he must be the only begotten of the Father. Blessed be his name. And he is full of grace. Ah, had he not been, I should never have been saved. He drew me when I struggled to escape from His grace, and when at last I came all trembling, like a condemned culprit to His mercy seat, He said, Thy sins, which are many, are all forgiven thee. Be of good cheer. And He is full of truth. True have His promises been, not one has failed. I bear witness that never servant had such a master as I have. Never brother, such a kinsman, as he has been to me. Never spouse, such a husband as Christ, has been to my soul. Never sinner, a better saviour. Never mourner, a better comforter, than Christ hath been to my spirit. I want none beside him. In life he is my life, and in death he shall be the death of death. In poverty Christ is my riches. In sickness he makes my bed. In darkness he is my star and in brightness he is my son. He is the manna of the camp in the wilderness, and he shall be the new corn of the host when they come to Canaan. Jesus is to me all grace and no wrath, all truth and no falsehood.
and of truth and grace he is full, infinitely full. My soul, this night, bless with all thy might the only begotten. Morning and Evening Devotional by Charles Haddon Spurgeon Morning, May 11th Matthew, chapter 28, verse 20 And teaching them to obey all that I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always, even to the end of the age. It is well, there is one who is ever the same, and who is ever with us. It is well, there is one stable rock amidst the billows of the sea of life. O oh, my soul, set not thine affections upon rusting, moth-eaten, decaying treasures, but set thine heart upon him who abides forever faithful to thee. Build not thine house upon the moving quicksands of a deceitful world, but found thy hopes upon this rock, which, amid descending rain and roaring floods, shall stand immovably secure. My soul, I charge thee, lay up thy treasure in the only secure cabinet, store thy jewels where thou canst never lose them. Put thine all in Christ, set all thine affections on his person, all thy hope in his merit, all thy trust in his efficacious blood, all thy joy in his presence, and so thou mayest laugh at loss and defy destruction. Remember that all the flowers in the world's garden fade by turns, and the day cometh when nothing will be left but the black, cold earth. Death's black extinguisher must soon put out thy candle. Oh, how sweet to have sunlight when the candle is gone! The dark flood must soon roll between thee and all the hast. Then wed thine heart to him who will never leave thee. Trust thyself with him who will go with thee through the black and surging current of death's stream, and who will land thee safely on the celestial shore, and make thee sit with him in heavenly places forever. Go, sorrowing son of affliction, tell thy secrets to the friend who sticketh closer than a brother. Trust all thy concerns with him who never can be taken from thee, who will never leave thee, and who will never let thee leave him, even Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, and today, and forever. Lo, I am with you alway, is enough for my soul to live upon, let who will forsake me. Morning and Evening Devotional by Charles Haddon Spurgeon Evening, May 11th Joshua chapter 1 verse 7 Above all, be strong and very courageous. Be careful to observe all the law that my servant Moses commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, so that you may prosper wherever you go. Our God's tender love for His servants makes Him concerned for the state of their inward feelings. He desires them to be of good courage. Some esteem it a small thing for a believer to be vexed with doubts and fears, but God thinks not so. From this text, it is plain that our Master would not have us entangled with fears. He would have us without carefulness, without doubt, without cowardice. Our Master does not think so lightly of our unbelief as we do. When we are desponding, we are subject to a grievous malady not to be trifled with, but to be carried at once to the beloved physician. Our Lord loveth not to see our countenance sad. It was a law of Ahasuerus that no one should come into the king's court dressed in mourning. This is not the law of the king of kings, for we may come mourning as we are. But still, he would have us put off the spirit of heaviness and put on the garment of praise for there is much reason to rejoice. The Christian man ought to be of a courageous spirit, in order that he may glorify the Lord by enduring trials in an heroic manner. If he be fearful and faint-hearted, it will dishonor his God. Besides, what a bad example it is! This disease of doubtfulness and discouragement is an epidemic which soon spreads amongst the Lord's flock. 
One downcast believer makes twenty souls sad. Moreover, unless your courage is kept up, Satan will be too much for you. Let your spirit be joyful in God your Savior. The joy of the Lord shall be your strength, and no fiend of hell shall make headway against you, but cowardice throws down the banner. Moreover, labor is light to a man of cheerful spirit, and success waits upon cheerfulness. The man who toils, rejoicing in his God, believing with all his heart, has success guaranteed. He who sows in hope shall reap in joy. Therefore, dear reader, be thou strong and very courageous. Morning and Evening Devotional by Charles Haddon Spurgeon Morning, May 12th John chapter 14 verse 21 Whoever has my commandments and keeps them is the one who loves me. The one who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and reveal myself to him. The Lord Jesus gives special revelations of himself to his people. Even if Scripture did not declare this, there are many of the children of God who could testify the truth of it from their own experience. They have had manifestations of their Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in a peculiar manner, such as no mere reading or hearing could afford. In the biographies of eminent saints, you will find many instances recorded in which Jesus has been pleased in a very special manner to speak to their souls and to unfold the wonders of His person. Yea, so have their souls been steeped in happiness that they have thought themselves to be in heaven, whereas they were not there, though they were well nigh on the threshold of it. For when Jesus manifests himself to his people, it is heaven on earth, it is paradise in embryo, it is bliss begun. Especial manifestations of Christ exercise a holy influence on the believer's heart. One effect will be humility. If a man says, I have had such and such spiritual communications. I am a great man. He has never had any communion with Jesus at all. For God hath respect unto the lowly, but the proud he knoweth afar off. He does not need to come near them to know them, and will never give them any visits of love. Another effect will be happiness, for in God's presence there are pleasures forevermore. Holiness will be sure to follow. A man who has no holiness has never had this manifestation. Some men profess a great deal, but we must not believe anyone unless we see that his deeds answer to what he says. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. He will not bestow his favors upon the wicked, for while he will not cast away a perfect man, neither will he respect an evil doer. Thus there will be three effects of nearness to Jesus, humility, happiness, and holiness. May God give them to thee, Christian. Morning and Evening Devotional by Charles Haddon Spurgeon Evening, May 12th Genesis chapter 46, verse 3, form 4 I am God, he said, the God of your father. Do not be afraid to go down to Egypt, for I will make you into a great nation there. I will go down with you to Egypt, and I will surely bring you back, and Joseph's own hands will close your eyes. Jacob must have shuddered at the thought of leaving the land of his father's sojourning and dwelling among heathen strangers. It was a new scene, and likely to be a trying one. Who shall venture among couriers of a foreign monarch without anxiety? Yet the way was evidently appointed for him, and therefore he resolved to go. This is frequently the position of believers now. They are called to perils and temptations altogether untried. At such seasons let them imitate Jacob's example by offering sacrifices of prayer unto God and seeking his direction. Let them not take a step until they have waited upon the Lord for his blessing. Then they will have Jacob's companion to be their friend and helper. How blessed to feel assured that the Lord is with us in all our ways, 
and condescends to go down into our humiliations and banishments with us. Even beyond the ocean, our Father's love beams like the sun in its strength. We cannot hesitate to go where Jehovah promises His presence. Even the valley of deathshade grows bright with the radiance of this assurance. Marching onwards with faith in their God, believers shall have Jacob's promise. They shall be brought up again, whether it be from the troubles of life or the chambers of death. Jacob's seed came out of Egypt in due time, and so shall all the faithful pass unscathed through the tribulation of life and the terror of death. Let us exercise Jacob's confidence. Fear not, is the Lord's command and His divine encouragement to those who at His bidding are launching upon new seas. The divine presence and preservation forbid so much as one unbelieving fear. Without our God we should fear to move. But when He bids us to, it would be dangerous to tarry. Reader, go forward and fear not. Morning and Evening Devotional by Charles Haddon Spurgeon Morning, May 13th Psalm 30, verse 5 For his anger is fleeting, but his favour lasts a lifetime. Weeping may stay the night, but joy comes in the morning. Christian, if thou art in a night of trial, think of the morrow. Cheer up thy heart with the thought of the coming of thy Lord. Be patient, for Lo, he comes with clouds descending. Be patient. The husbandman waits until he reaps his harvest. Be patient, for you know who has said, Behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me, to give to every man according as his work shall be. If you are never so wretched now, remember. A few more rolling suns, at most, will land thee on fair Canaan's coast. Thy head may be crowned with thorny troubles now, but it shall wear a starry crown ere long. Thy hand may be filled with cares. It shall sweep the strings of the harp of heaven soon. Thy garments may be soiled with dust now. They shall be white by and by. Wait a little longer. Ah, how despicable our troubles and trials will seem when we look back upon them. Looking at them here in the prospect, they seem immense. But when we get to heaven, we shall then, with transporting joys, recount the labours of our feet. Our trials will then seem light and momentary afflictions. Let us go on boldly. If the night be never so dark, the morning cometh, which is more than they can say who are shut up in the darkness of hell. Do you know what it is thus to live on the future, to live on expectation, to antedate heaven? Happy believer to have so sure, so comforting a hope. It may be all dark now, but it will soon be light. It may be all trial now, but it will soon be all happiness. What matters it though weeping may endure for a night, when joy cometh in the morning? Morning and Evening Devotional by Charles Haddon Spurgeon Evening, May 13th Psalm 119, verse 57 The Lord is my portion, I have promised to keep your words. Look at thy possessions, O believer, and compare thy portion with the lot of thy fellowmen. Some of them have their portion in the field, they are rich, and their harvests yield them a golden increase. But what are harvests compared with thy God? Who is the God of harvests? What are bursting granaries compared with him? Who is the husbandman and feeds thee with the bread of heaven? Some have their portion in the city. Their wealth is abundant and flows to them in constant streams until they become a very reservoir of gold. But what is gold compared with thy God? Thou couldst not live on it. Thy spiritual life could not be sustained by it. Put it on a troubled conscience, and could it allay its pangs? Apply it to a desponding heart, and see if it could stay a solitary groan, or give one grief the less. 
but thou hast God, and in him thou hast more than gold or riches ever could buy. Some have their portion in that which most men love, applause and fame. But ask thyself, is not thy God more to thee than that? What if a myriad clarions should be loud in thine applause? Would this prepare thee to pass the Jordan, or cheer thee in prospect of judgment? No. There are griefs in life which wealth cannot alleviate, and there is the deep need of a dying hour for which no riches can provide. But when thou hast God for thy portion, thou hast more than all else put together. In him every want is met, whether in life or in death. With God for thy portion thou art rich indeed, for he will supply thy need, comfort thy heart, assuage thy grief, guide thy steps, be with thee in the dark valley, and then take thee home, to enjoy him as thy portion forever. I have enough, said Esau. This is the best thing a worldly man can say. But Jacob replies, I have all things, which is a note too high for carnal minds. Morning and Evening Devotional by Charles Haddon Spurgeon Morning, May 14th Romans chapter 8, verse 17 And if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with Him, so that we may also be glorified with Him. The boundless realms of His Father's universe are Christ's by prescriptive right. As heir of all things, He is the sole proprietor of the vast creation of God, and He has admitted us to claim the whole as ours, by virtue of that deed of joint heirship which the Lord hath ratified with His chosen people. The golden streets of paradise, the pearly gates, the river of life, the transcendent bliss, and the unutterable glory are, by our blessed Lord, made over to us for our everlasting possession. All that He has, He shares with His people. The crown royal He has placed upon the head of His church, appointing her a kingdom, and calling her sons a royal priesthood a generation of priests and kings. He uncrowned himself that we might have a coronation of glory. He would not sit upon his own throne until he had procured a place upon it for all who overcome by his blood. Crown the head and the whole body shares the honor. Behold here the reward of every Christian conqueror, Christ's throne, crown, scepter, palace, treasure, robes, heritage are yours, far superior to the jealousy, selfishness, and greed which admit of no participation of their advantages, Christ deems his happiness completed by his people sharing it. The glory which thou gavest me have I given them. These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. The smiles of his father are all the sweeter to him, because his people share them. The honors of his kingdom are more pleasing, because his people appear with him in glory. More valuable to him are his conquests, since they have taught his people to overcome. He delights in his throne, because on it there is a place for them. He rejoices in his royal robes, since over them his skirts are spread. He delights the more in his joy, because he calls them to enter into it. Morning and Evening Devotional by Charles Haddon Spurgeon Evening, May 14th Isaiah, chapter 40, verse 11 He tends his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in his arms and carries them close to his heart. He gently leads the nursing ewes. Who is he of whom such gracious words are spoken? He is the good shepherd. Why doth he carry the lambs in his bosom? Because he hath a tender heart, and any weakness at once melts his heart. The sighs, the ignorance, the feebleness of the little ones of his flock draw forth his compassion. It is his office, as a faithful high priest, to consider the weak. Besides, he purchased them with blood 
they are his property. He must and will care for that which cost him so dear. Then he is responsible for each lamb, bound by covenant engagements not to lose one. Moreover, they are all a part of his glory and reward. But how may we understand the expression, he will carry them? Sometimes he carries them by not permitting them to endure much trial. Providence deals tenderly with them. Often they are carried by being filled with an unusual degree of love, so that they bear up and stand fast. Though their knowledge may not be deep, they have great sweetness in what they do know. Frequently he carries them by giving them a very simple faith, which takes the promise just as it stands, and believingly runs with every trouble straight to Jesus. The simplicity of their faith gives them an unusual degree of confidence, which carries them above the world. He carries the lambs in his bosom. Here is boundless affection. Would he put them in his bosom if he did not love them much? Here is tender nearness, so near are they that they could not possibly be nearer. Here is hallowed familiarity. There are precious love passages between Christ and his weak ones. Here is perfect safety. In his bosom, who can hurt them? They must hurt the shepherd first. Here is perfect rest and sweetest comfort. Surely we are not sufficiently sensible of the infinite tenderness of Jesus. Morning and Evening Devotional by Charles Haddon Spurgeon Morning, May 15th Acts chapter 13 verse 39 Through him, everyone who believes is justified from everything from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. The believer in Christ receives a present justification. Faith does not produce this fruit by and by, but now. So far as justification is the result of faith, it is given to the soul in the moment when it closes with Christ and accepts Him as its all in all. Are they who stand before the throne of God justified now? So are we, as truly and as clearly justified as they who walk in white and sing melodious praises to celestial harps. The thief upon the cross was justified the moment that he turned the eye of faith to Jesus. And Paul, the aged after years of service, was not more justified than was the thief with no service at all. We are today accepted in the Beloved, today absolved from sin, today acquitted at the bar of God. Oh, soul-transporting thought, there are some clusters of Eshkol's vine which we shall not be able to gather till we enter heaven, but this is a bough which runneth over the wall. This is not as the corn of the land, which we can never eat till we cross the Jordan. But this is part of the manna in the wilderness, a portion of our daily nutriment with which God supplies us in our journeying to and fro. We are now, even now pardoned, even now are our sins put away, even now we stand in the sight of God accepted, as though we had never been guilty. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. There is not a sin in the book of God, even now, against one of his people. Who dareth to lay anything to their charge? There is neither speck, nor spot, nor wrinkle, nor any such thing remaining upon any one believer in the matter of justification in the sight of the judge of all the earth. Let present privilege awaken us to present duty, and now, while life lasts, let us spend and be spent for our sweet Lord Jesus. Morning and Evening Devotional by Charles Haddon Spurgeon Evening, May 15th Hebrews chapter 12 verse 23 In joyful assembly to the congregation of the firstborn enrolled in heaven, you have come to God the Judge of all, to the spirits of the righteous 
made perfect. Recollect that there are two kinds of perfection which the Christian needs. The perfection of justification in the person of Jesus, and the perfection of sanctification wrought in him by the Holy Spirit. At present, corruption yet remains even in the breasts of the regenerate. Experience soon teaches us this. Within us are still lusts and evil imaginations. But I rejoice to know that the day is coming when God shall finish the work which he has begun, and he shall present my soul, not only perfect in Christ, but perfect through the Spirit, without spot or blemish, or any such thing. Can it be true that this poor, sinful heart of mine is to become holy even as God is holy? Can it be that this Spirit, which often cries, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this sin and death, shall get rid of sin and death, that I shall have no evil things to vex my ears and no unholy thoughts to disturb my peace. O oh, happy hour, may it be hastened. When I cross the Jordan, the work of sanctification will be finished, but not till that moment shall I even claim perfection in myself. Then my spirit shall have its last baptism in the Holy Spirit's fire. Methinks I long to die to receive that last and final purification which shall usher me into heaven. Not an angel more pure than I shall be, for I shall be able to say, in a double sense, I am clean through Jesus' blood and through the Spirit's work. Oh, how should we extol the power of the Holy Ghost in thus making us fit to stand before our Father in heaven. Yet let not the hope of perfection hereafter make us content with imperfection now. If it does this, our hope cannot be genuine, for a good hope is a purifying thing even now. The work of grace must be abiding in us now, or it cannot be perfected then. Let us pray to be filled with the Spirit, that we may bring forth increasingly the fruits of Righteousness. Morning and Evening Devotional by Charles Haddon Spurgeon Morning, May 16th 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 17 Instruct those who are rich in the present age not to be conceited and not to put their hope in the uncertainty of wealth, but in God, who richly provides all things for us to enjoy. Our Lord Jesus is ever giving, and does not for a solitary instant withdraw his hand. As long as there is a vessel of grace not yet full to the brim, the oil shall not be stayed. He is a sun never shining. He is manna always falling round the camp. He is a rock in the desert, ever sending out streams of life from his smitten side. The rain of his grace is always dropping. The river of his bounty is ever flowing, and the well spring of his love is constantly overflowing. As the king can never die, so his grace can never fail. Daily we pluck his fruit, and daily his branches bend down to our hand with a fresh store of mercy. There are seven feast days in his weeks, and as many as are the days, so many are the banquets in his years. Who has ever returned from his door unblessed? Who has ever risen from his table unsatisfied, or from his bosom unemparadized? His mercies are new every morning and fresh every evening. Who can know the number of his benefits, or recount the list of his bounties? Every sand which drops from the glass of time is but the tardy follower of a myriad of mercies. The wings of our hours are covered with the silver of his kindness and with the yellow gold of his affection. The river of time bears from the mountains of eternity the golden sands of his favor. The countless stars are but as the standard bearers of a more innumerable host of blessings. Who can count the dust of the benefits which he bestows on Jacob or tell the number of the fourth part of his mercies towards Israel? How shall my soul extol him who daily loadeth us with benefits and who crowneth us with loving kindness? 
Oh, that my praise could be as ceaseless as his bounty! O oh, miserable tongue, how canst thou be silent? Wake up, I pray thee, lest I call thee no more my glory, but my shame. Awake, psaltery and harp. I myself will awake right early. Morning and Evening Devotional by Charles Haddon Spurgeon Evening, May 16th 2 Kings chapter 3, verse 16-17 And he said, This is what the Lord says, Dig this valley full of ditches. For the Lord says, You will not see wind or rain, but the valley will be filled with water, and you will drink, you and your cattle and your animals. The armies of the three kings were famishing for want of water. God was about to send it. And in these words, the prophet announced the coming blessing. Here was a case of human helplessness. Not a drop of water could all the valiant men procure from the skies or find in the wells of earth. Thus often, the people of the Lord are at their wits' end. They see the vanity of the creature and learn experimentally where their help is to be found. Still, the people were to make a believing preparation for the divine blessing. They were to dig the trenches in which the precious liquid would be held. The church must, by her varied agencies, efforts, and prayers, make herself ready to be blessed. She must make the pools, and the Lord will fill them. This must be done in faith, in the full assurance that the blessing is about to descend. By and by there was a singular bestowal of the needed boon. Not as in Elijah's case did the shower pour from the clouds, but in a silent and mysterious manner the pools were filled. The Lord has his own sovereign modes of action. He is not tied to manner and time as we are, but doeth as he pleases among the sons of men. It is ours, thankfully, to receive from him, and not to dictate to him. We must also notice the remarkable abundance of the supply. There was enough for the need of all. And so it is in the gospel blessing. All the wants of the congregation and of the entire church shall be met by the divine power in answer to prayer. And above all this, victory shall be speedily given to the armies of the Lord. What am I doing for Jesus? What trenches am I digging? O Lord, make me ready to receive the blessing which Thou art so willing to bestow. Morning and Evening Devotional by Charles Haddon Spurgeon Morning, May 17th 1 John chapter 2, verse 6 Whoever claims to abide in Him must walk as Jesus walked. Why should Christians imitate Christ? They should do it for their own sakes. If they desire to be in a healthy state of soul, if they would escape the sickness of sin and enjoy the vigor of growing grace, let Jesus be their model. For their own happiness' sake, if they would drink wine on the lees, well refined, if they would enjoy holy and happy communion with Jesus, if they would be lifted up above the cares and troubles of this world, let them walk even as he walked. There is nothing which can so assist you to walk towards heaven with good speed as wearing the image of Jesus on your heart to rule all its motions. It is when, by the power of the Holy Spirit, you are enabled to walk with Jesus in his very footsteps, that you are most happy and most known to be the sons of God. Peter afar off is both unsafe and uneasy. Next, for religion's sake, strive to be like Jesus. Ah, poor religion, thou hast been sorely shot at by cruel foes, but thou hast not been wounded one half so dangerously by thy foes as by thy friends. Who made those wounds in the fair hand of godliness? The professor who used the dagger of hypocrisy, the man who with pretenses enters the fold, being naught but a wolf in sheep's clothing, worries the flock more than the lion outside. There is no weapon half so deadly as a Judas kiss. Inconsistent professors 
injure the gospel more than the sneering critic or the infidel. But, especially for Christ's own sake, imitate his example. Christian, lovest thou thy Saviour? Is his name precious to thee? Is his cause dear to thee? Wouldst thou see the kingdoms of the world become his? Is it thy desire that he should be glorified? Art thou longing that souls should be won to him? If so, imitate Jesus, be an epistle of Christ, known and read of all men. Morning and Evening Devotional by Charles Haddon Spurgeon Evening, May 17th Isaiah chapter 41 verse 9 I brought you from the ends of the earth and called you from its farthest corners. I said, You are my servant. I have chosen and not rejected you. If we have received the grace of God in our hearts, its practical effect has been to make us God's servants. We may be unfaithful servants, we certainly are unprofitable ones, but yet, blessed be his name, we are his servants, wearing his livery, feeding at his table, and obeying his commands. We were once the servants of sin, but he who made us free has now taken us into his family and taught us obedience to his will. We do not serve our master perfectly, but we would if we could. As we hear God's voice saying unto us, Thou art my servant, we can answer with David, I am thy servant, thou hast loosed my bonds. But the Lord calls us not only his servants, but his chosen ones. I have chosen thee. We have not chosen him first, but he hath chosen us. If we be God's servants, we were not always so. To sovereign grace, the change must be ascribed. The eye of sovereignty singled us out, and the voice of unchanging grace declared, I have loved thee with an everlasting love. Long ere time began or space was created, God had written upon his heart the names of his elect people, had predestinated them to be conformed unto the image of his Son, and ordained them heirs of all the fullness of his love, his grace, and his glory. What comfort is here? Has the Lord loved us so long, and will he yet cast us away? He knew how stiff-necked we should be. He understood that our hearts were evil, and yet he made the choice. Ah, our Savior is no fickle lover. He doth not feel enchanted for a while with some gleams of beauty from his church's eye, and then, afterwards, cast her off because of her unfaithfulness. Nay, he married her in old eternity, and it is written of Jehovah, he hateth putting away. The eternal choice is a bond upon our gratitude and upon his faithfulness, which neither can disown. Morning and Evening Devotional by Charles Haddon Spurgeon Morning, May 18th Colossians chapter 2 verses 9 and 10. For in Christ all the fullness of the deity dwells in bodily form. Therefore, since you have been raised with Christ, strive for the things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. All the attributes of Christ, as God and man, are at our disposal. All the fullness of the Godhead, whatever that marvelous term may comprehend, is ours to make us complete. He cannot endow us with the attributes of deity, but he has done all that can be done, for he has made even his divine power and Godhead subservient to our salvation. His omnipotence, omniscience, omnipresence, immutability and infallibility are all combined for our defense. Arise, believer, and behold the Lord Jesus yoking the whole of his divine Godhead to the chariot of salvation. How vast his grace! How firm his faithfulness! How unswerving his immutability! How infinite his power! How limitless his knowledge! All these are by the Lord Jesus made the pillars of the temple of salvation, and all, without diminution of their infinity, are covenanted to us 
as our perpetual inheritance. The fathomless love of the Saviour's heart is every drop of it ours, every sinew in the arm of might, every jewel in the crown of majesty, the immensity of divine knowledge, and the sternness of divine justice, all are ours and shall be employed for us. The whole of Christ, in his adorable character as the Son of God, is by himself made over to us most richly to enjoy. His wisdom is our direction, his knowledge our instruction, his power our protection, his justice our surety, his love our comfort, his mercy our solace, and his immutability our trust. He makes no reserve, but opens the recesses of the Mount of God and bids us dig in its mines for the hidden treasures. All, all, all are yours, saith he, be ye satisfied with favor and full of the goodness of the Lord. Oh, how sweet thus to behold Jesus and to call upon him with the certain confidence that in seeking the interposition of his love or power, we are but asking for that which he has already faithfully promised. Morning and Evening Devotional by Charles Haddon Spurgeon Evening, May 18th Hebrews chapter 12, verse 11 No discipline seems enjoyable at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it yields a harvest of righteousness and peace to those who have been trained by it. How happy are tried Christians afterwards! No calm more deep than that which succeeds a storm. Who has not rejoiced in clear shinings after rain? Victorious banquets are for well-exercised soldiers. After killing the lion, we eat the honey. After climbing the hill difficulty, we sit down in the arbor to rest. After traversing the valley of humiliation, after fighting with Apollyon, the shining one appears with the healing branch from the tree of life. Our sorrows, like the passing keels of the vessels upon the sea, leave a silver line of holy light behind them afterwards. It is peace, sweet, deep peace, which follows the horrible turmoil which once reigned in our tormented guilty souls. See then the happy estate of a Christian. He has his best things last, and he therefore in this world receives his worst things first. But even his worst things are afterward good things, harsh plowings yielding joyful harvests. Even now he grows rich by his losses, he rises by his falls, he lives by dying, and becomes full by being emptied. If then his grievous afflictions yield him so much peaceable fruit in this life, what shall be the full vintage of joy afterwards in heaven? If his dark nights are as bright as the world's days, what shall his days be? If even his starlight is more splendid than the sun, what must his sunlight be? If he can sing in a dungeon, how sweetly will he sing in heaven? If he can praise the Lord in the fires, how will he extol him before the eternal throne? If evil be good to him now, what will the overflowing goodness of God be to him then? O oh, blessed afterward! Who would not be a Christian? Who would not bear the present cross for the crown which cometh afterwards? But herein is work for patience. For the rest is not for today, nor the triumph for the present, but afterward. Wait, O soul, and let patience have her perfect work. Morning and Evening Devotional by Charles Haddon Spurgeon Morning, May 19th Ecclesiastes chapter 10 verse 7 I have seen slaves on horseback, while princes go on foot like slaves. Upstarts frequently usurp the highest places, while the truly great pine in obscurity. This is a riddle in Providence, whose solution will one day gladden the hearts of the upright. But it is so common a fact that none of us should murmur if it should fall to our own lot. When our Lord was upon earth, although he is the prince of the kings of the earth, Yet he walked the footpath of weariness and service as the servant of servants. 
What wonder is it if his followers, who are princes of the blood, should also be looked down upon as inferior and contemptible persons? The world is upside down, and therefore the first are last, and the last first. See how the servile sons of Satan lord it in the earth. What a high horse they ride! How they lift up their horn on high! Haman is in the court, while Mordecai sits in the gate. David wanders on the mountains while Saul reigns in state. Elijah is complaining in the cave, while Jezebel is boasting in the palace. Yet who would wish to take the places of the proud rebels? And who, on the other hand, might not envy the despised saints? When the wheel turns, those who are lowest rise, and the highest sink. Patience then, believer, eternity will right the wrongs of time. Let us not fall into the error of letting our passions and carnal appetites ride in triumph, while our nobler powers walk in the dust. Grace must reign as a prince, and make the members of the body instruments of righteousness. The Holy Spirit loves order, and He therefore sets our powers and faculties in due rank and place, giving the highest room to those spiritual faculties which link us with the great King. Let us not disturb the divine arrangement, but ask for grace that we may keep under our body and bring it into subjection. We were not new created to allow our passions to rule over us, but that we, as kings, may reign in Christ Jesus over the triple kingdom of spirit, soul, and body, to the glory of God the Father. Morning and Evening Devotional by Charles Haddon Spurgeon Evening, May 19th 1 Kings, chapter 19, verse 4 While he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness, he sat down under a broom tree and prayed that he might die. I have had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life, for I am no better than my father's. It was a remarkable thing that the man who was never to die, for whom God had ordained an infinitely better lot, the man who should be carried to heaven in a chariot of fire and be translated that he should not see death, should thus pray, Let me die, I am no better than my father's. We have here a memorable proof that God does not always answer prayer in kind, though he always does in effect. He gave Elias something better than that which he asked for, and thus really heard and answered him. Strange was it that the lion-hearted Elijah should be so depressed by Jezebel's threat as to ask to die, and blessedly kind was it on the part of our Heavenly Father that he did not take his desponding servant at his word. There is a limit to the doctrine of the prayer of faith. We are not to expect that God will give us everything we choose to ask for. We know that we sometimes ask and do not receive because we ask amiss. If we ask for that which is not promised, if we run counter to the Spirit which the Lord would have us cultivate, if we ask contrary to His will or to the decrees of His providence, if we ask merely for the gratification of our own ease and without an eye to His glory, we must not expect that we shall receive. Yet, when we ask in faith, nothing doubting, if we receive not the precise thing asked for, we shall receive an equivalent and more than an equivalent for it. As one remarks, if the Lord does not pay in silver, he will in gold. And if he does not pay in gold, he will in diamonds. If he does not give you precisely what you ask for, he will give you that which is tantamount to it, and that which you will greatly rejoice to receive in lieu thereof. Be then, dear reader, much in prayer and make this evening a season of earnest intercession. But take heed what you ask. Morning and Evening Devotional by Charles Haddon Spurgeon 
Morning, May 20th. Psalm 17, verse 7. Show the wonders of your loving devotion, you who save by your right hand those who seek refuge from their foes. When we give our hearts with our alms, we give well, but we must often plead to a failure in this respect. Not so our Master and our Lord. His favors are always performed with the love of His heart. He does not send to us the cold meat and the broken pieces from the table of His luxury, but He dips our morsel in His own dish and seasons our provisions with the spices of His fragrant affections. When He puts the golden tokens of His grace into our palms, He accompanies the gift with such a warm pressure of our hand that the manner of His giving is as precious as the boon itself. He will come into our houses upon His errands of kindness, and He will not act as some austere visitors do in the poor man's cottage, but He sits by our side not despising our poverty, nor blaming our weakness. Beloved, with what smiles does he speak? What golden sentences drop from his gracious lips? What embraces of affection does he bestow upon us? If he had but given us farthings, the way of his giving would have gilded them. But as it is, the costly arms are set in a golden basket by his pleasant carriage. It is impossible to doubt the sincerity of his charity, for there is a bleeding heart stamped upon the face of all his benefactions. He giveth liberally and upbraideth not. Not one hint that we are burdensome to him, not one cold look for his poor pensioners, but he rejoices in his mercy and presses us to his bosom while he is pouring out his life for us. There is a fragrance in his spikenard which nothing but his heart could produce. There is a sweetness in his honeycomb which could not be in it unless the very essence of his soul's affection had been mingled with it. Oh, the rare communion which such singular heartiness effecteth! May we continually taste and know the blessedness of it. Morning and Evening Devotional by Charles Haddon Spurgeon Evening, May 20th Hosea, chapter 11, verse 4. I led them with cords of kindness, with ropes of love. I lifted the yoke from their necks and bent down to feed them. Our Heavenly Father often draws us with the cords of love. But ah, how backward we are to run towards Him. How slowly do we respond to His gentle impulses. He draws us to exercise a more simple faith in Him. But we have not yet attained to Abraham's confidence. We do not leave our worldly cares with God, but like Martha, we cumber ourselves with much serving. Our meager faith brings leanness into our souls. We do not open our mouths wide, though God has promised to fill them. Does He not this evening draw us to trust Him? Can we not hear Him say, Come, my child, and trust me? The veil is rent. Enter into my presence and approach boldly to the throne of my grace. I am worthy of thy fullest confidence. Cast thy cares on me. Shake thyself from the dust of thy cares, and put on thy beautiful garments of joy. But alas, though called with tones of love to the blessed exercise of this comforting grace, we will not come. At another time, he draws us to closer communion with Himself. We have been sitting on the doorstep of God's house, and He bids us advance into the banqueting hall and sup with Him, but we decline the honor. There are secret rooms not yet open to us. Jesus invites us to enter them, but we hold back. Shame on our cold hearts. We are but poor lovers of our sweet Lord Jesus, not fit to be His servants much less to be his brides, and yet he hath exalted us to be bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh, married to him by a glorious marriage covenant. Herein is love, but it is love which takes no denial. If we obey not the gentle drawings of his love, he will send affliction to drive us into closer intimacy with himself. 
have us nearer he will. What foolish children we are to refuse those bands of love, and so bring upon our backs that scourge of small cords which Jesus knows how to use. Morning and Evening Devotional by Charles Haddon Spurgeon Morning, May 21st 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 3 now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. If, then, this is not a matter to be taken for granted concerning every one of the human race. If, then there is a possibility and a probability that some may not have tasted that the Lord is gracious. If, then this is not a general but a special mercy, and it is needful to inquire whether we know the grace of God by inward experience. There is no spiritual favor which may not be a matter for heart-searching. But while this should be a matter of earnest and prayerful inquiry, no one ought to be content whilst there is any such thing as an if about his having tasted that the Lord is gracious. A jealous and holy distrust of self may give rise to the question even in the believer's heart, but the continuance of such a doubt would be an evil indeed. We must not rest without a desperate struggle to clasp the Saviour in the arms of faith and say, I know whom I have believed, and I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him. Do not rest, O believer, till thou hast a full assurance of thine interest in Jesus. Let nothing satisfy thee till by the infallible witness of the Holy Spirit, bearing witness with thy spirit, thou art certified that thou art a child of God. Oh, trifle not here. Let no, perhaps, and peradventure, and if, and maybe, satisfy thy soul. Build on eternal verities, and verily build upon them. Get the sure mercies of David, and surely get them. Let thine anchor be cast into that which is within the veil, and see to it that thy soul be linked to the anchor by a cable that will not break. Advance beyond these dreary ifs, abide no more in the wilderness of doubts and fears, cross the Jordan of distrust, and enter the Canaan of peace, where the Canaanite still lingers, but where the land ceaseth not to flow with milk and honey. Morning and Evening Devotional by Charles Haddon Spurgeon Evening, May 21st Genesis chapter 42, verse 2 Look, he added, I have heard that there is grain in Egypt. Go down there and buy some for us, so that we may live and not die. Famine pinched all the nations, and it seemed inevitable that Jacob and his family should suffer great want. But the God of Providence, who never forgets the objects of electing love, had stored a granary for his people by giving the Egyptians warning of the scarcity, and leading them to treasure up the grain of the years of plenty. Little did Jacob expect deliverance from Egypt, but there was the corn in store for him. Believer, though all things are apparently against thee, rest assured that God has made a reservation on thy behalf. In the roll of thy griefs there is a saving clause. Somehow he will deliver thee, and somewhere he will provide for thee. The quarter from which thy rescue shall arise may be a very unexpected one, but help will assuredly come in thine extremity, and thou shalt magnify the name of the Lord. If men do not feed thee, ravens shall, and if earth yield not wheat, Heaven shall drop with manna. Therefore be of good courage, and rest quietly in the Lord. God can make the sun rise in the west if he pleases, and make the source of distress the channel of delight. The corn in Egypt was all in the hands of the beloved Joseph. He opened or closed the granaries at will. And so the riches of providence are all in the absolute power of our Lord Jesus, who will dispense them liberally to his people. Joseph was abundantly ready to succor his own family, and Jesus is unceasing in his faithful care for his brethren. Our business is to go after the help 
which is provided for us. We must not sit still in despondency, but bestir ourselves. Prayer will bear us soon into the presence of our royal brother. Once before his throne, we have only to ask and have. His stores are not exhausted. There is corn still. His heart is not hard. He will give the corn to us. Lord, forgive our unbelief, and this evening constrain us to draw largely from thy fullness and receive grace for grace. Morning and Evening Devotional by Charles Haddon Spurgeon Morning, May 22nd Psalm 107 verse 7 He led them on a straight path to reach a city where they could live. Changeful experience often leads the anxious believer to inquire, Why is it thus with me? I looked for light, but lo, darkness came, for peace but behold trouble. I said in my heart, my mountain standeth firm, I shall never be moved. Lord, thou dost hide thy face, and I am troubled. It was but yesterday that I could read my title clear. Today my evidences are bedimmed, and my hopes are clouded. Yesterday I could climb to Pisgah's top, and view the landscape o'er, and rejoice with confidence in my future inheritance. Today my spirit has no hopes, but many fears. No joys, but much distress. Is this part of God's plan with me? Can this be the way in which God would bring me to heaven? Yes, it is even so. The eclipse of your faith, the darkness of your mind, the fainting of your hope, all these things are but parts of God's method of making you ripe for the great inheritance upon which you shall soon enter. These trials, are for the testing and strengthening of your faith. They are waves that wash you further upon the rock. They are winds which waft your ship the more swiftly towards the desired haven. According to David's words, so it might be said of you, so he bringeth them to their desired haven. By honor and dishonor, by evil report and by good report, by plenty and by poverty, by joy and by distress, by persecution and by peace. By all these things is the life of your souls maintained, and by each of these are you helped on your way. Oh, think not, believer, that your sorrows are out of God's plan. They are necessary parts of it. We must, through much tribulation, enter the kingdom. Learn, then, even to count it all joy when ye fall into divers temptations. O oh, let my trembling soul be still, and wait thy wise, thy holy will. I cannot, Lord, thy purpose see, yet all is well since ruled by thee. Morning and Evening Devotional by Charles Haddon Spurgeon Evening, May 22nd Song of Solomon, Chapter 1, Verse 16 How handsome you are, my beloved! Oh, how delightful! The soft grass is our bed. From every point our well-beloved is most fair. Our various experiences are meant by our Heavenly Father to furnish fresh standpoints from which we may view the loveliness of Jesus. How amiable are our trials when they carry us aloft, where we may gain clearer views of Jesus than ordinary life could afford us. We have seen Him from the top of Amana, from the top of Shenir and Hermon, and He has shone upon us as the sun in His strength. But we have seen him also from the lion's dens, from the mountains of the leopards, and he has lost none of his loveliness. From the languishing of a sick bed, from the borders of the grave, have we turned our eyes to our soul's spouse, and he has never been otherwise than all fair. Many of his saints have looked upon him from the gloom of dungeons and from the red flames of the stake. Yet have they never uttered an ill word of him, but have died extolling his surpassing charms. O oh, noble and pleasant employment to be forever gazing at our sweet Lord Jesus! Is it not unspeakably delightful to view the Saviour in all his offices, and to perceive him matchless in each? To shift the kaleidoscope, as it were, and to find fresh combinations of peerless graces? In the manger, 
and in eternity, on the cross and on his throne, in the garden and in his kingdom, among thieves or in the midst of cherubim, he is everywhere altogether lovely. Examine carefully every little act of his life and every trait of his character, and he is as lovely in the minute as in the majestic. Judge him as you will, you cannot censure. Weigh him as you please, and he will not be found wanting. Eternity shall not discover the shadow of a spot in our beloved, but rather, as ages revolve, his hidden glories shall shine forth with yet more inconceivable splendor, and his unutterable loveliness shall more and more ravish all celestial minds. Morning and Evening Devotional by Charles Haddon Spurgeon Morning, May 23rd Psalm 138 verse 8 The Lord will fulfill His purpose for me. O Lord, Your loving devotion endures forever. Do not abandon the works of Your hands. Most manifestly, the confidence which the psalmist here expressed was a divine confidence. He did not say, I have grace enough to perfect that which concerneth me. My faith is so steady that it will not stagger. My love is so warm that it will never grow cold. My resolution is so firm that nothing can move it. No, his dependence was on the Lord alone. If we indulge in any confidence which is not grounded on the rock of ages, our confidence is worse than a dream. It will fall upon us and cover us with its ruins, to our sorrow and confusion. All that nature spins time will unravel, to the eternal confusion of all who are clothed therein. The psalmist was wise, he rested upon nothing short of the Lord's work. It is the Lord who has begun the good work within us, it is He who has carried it on, and if He does not finish it, it never will be complete. If there be one stitch in the celestial garment of our righteousness, which we are to insert ourselves, then we are lost. But this is our confidence. The Lord who began will perfect. He has done it all, must do it all, and will do it all. Our confidence must not be in what we have done, nor in what we have resolved to do, but entirely in what the Lord will do. Unbelief insinuates. You will never be able to stand. Look at the evil of your heart. You can never conquer sin. Remember the sinful pleasures and temptations of the world that beset you. You will be certainly allured by them and led astray. Ah, yes, we should indeed perish if left to our own strength. If we had alone to navigate our frail vessels over so rough a sea, we might well give up the voyage in despair. But thanks be to God, He will perfect that which concerneth us, and bring us to the desired haven. We can never be too confident when we confide in Him alone, and never too much concerned to have such a trust. Morning and Evening Devotional by Charles Haddon Spurgeon Evening May 23rd. Isaiah chapter 43 verse 24. You have not bought me sweet cane with your silver, nor satisfied me with the fat of your sacrifices, but you have burdened me with your sins. You have wearied me with your iniquities. Worshippers at the temple were wont to bring presents of sweet perfumes to be burned upon the altar of God. But Israel, in the time of her backsliding, became ungenerous, and made but few votive offerings to her Lord. This was an evidence of coldness of heart towards God and His house. Reader, does this never occur with you? Might not the complaint of the text be occasionally, if not frequently, brought against you? Those who are poor in pocket, if rich in faith, will be accepted none the less because their gifts are small. But, poor reader, do you give in fair proportion to the Lord? Or is the widow's might kept back from the sacred treasury? 
The rich believer should be thankful for the talent entrusted to him, but should not forget his large responsibility. For where much is given, much will be required. But, rich reader, are you mindful of your obligations, and rendering to the Lord according to the benefit received? Jesus gave his blood for us, what shall we give to him? We are his, and all that we have, for he has purchased us unto himself. Can we act as if we were our own? Oh, for more consecration! And to this end, oh, for more love! Blessed Jesus, how good it is of thee to accept our sweet cane bought with money! Nothing is too costly as a tribute to thine unrivaled love. And yet, thou dost receive with favor the smallest sincere token of affection. Thou dost receive our poor forget-me-nots and love tokens, as though they were intrinsically precious, though indeed they are, but as the bunch of wild flowers which the child brings to its mother. Never may we grow niggardly towards thee, and from this hour never may we hear thee complain of us again for withholding the gifts of our love. We will give thee the first fruits of our increase and pay thee tithes of all, and then we will confess of thine own have we given thee. Morning and Evening Devotional by Charles Haddon Spurgeon Morning, May 24th Psalm 66, verse 20 Blessed be God who has not rejected my prayer or withheld from me his loving devotion. In looking back upon the character of our prayers, if we do it honestly, we shall be filled with wonder that God has ever answered them. There may be some who think their prayers worthy of acceptance, as the Pharisee did, but the true Christian, in a more enlightened retrospect, weeps over his prayers, and if he could retrace his steps, he would desire to pray more earnestly. Remember, Christian, how cold thy prayers have been, when in thy closet thou shouldst have wrestled as Jacob did. But instead thereof, thy petitions have been faint and few, far removed from that humble, believing, persevering faith which cries, I will not let thee go except thou bless me. Yet, wonderful to say, God has heard these cold prayers of thine, and not only heard, but answered them. Reflect also how infrequent have been thy prayers, unless thou hast been in trouble, and then thou hast gone often to the mercy seat. But when deliverance has come, where has been thy constant supplication? Yet notwithstanding thou hast ceased to pray as once thou didst, God has not ceased to bless. When thou hast neglected the mercy seat, God has not deserted it, but the bright light of the Shekinah has always been visible between the wings of the cherubim. Oh, it is marvellous that the Lord should regard those intermittent spasms of importunity which come and go with our necessities. What a God is he thus to hear the prayers of those who come to him when they have pressing wants, but neglect him when they have received a mercy, who approach him when they are forced to come, but who almost forget to address him when mercies are plentiful and sorrows are few. Let his gracious kindness in hearing such prayers touch our hearts, so that we may henceforth be found praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. Morning and Evening Devotional by Charles Haddon Spurgeon Evening, May 24th Philippians chapter 1, verse 27 Nevertheless, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then, whether I come and see you, or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in one spirit, contending together as one for the faith of the gospel. The word conversation does not merely mean our talk and converse with one another, but the whole course of our life and behavior in the world. The Greek word signifies the actions and the privileges of citizenship, and thus we are commanded to let our actions, as citizens of the New Jerusalem, be such as becometh the gospel of Christ. 
What sort of conversation is this? In the first place, the gospel is very simple. So Christians should be simple and plain in their habits. There should be about our manner, our speech, our dress, our whole behavior, that simplicity which is the very soul of beauty. The gospel is preeminently true. It is gold without dross. And the Christian's life will be lusterless and valueless without the jewel of truth. The gospel is a very fearless gospel. It boldly proclaims the truth, whether men like it or not. We must be equally faithful and unflinching. But the gospel is also very gentle. Mark this spirit in its founder. A bruised reed he will not break. Some professors are sharper than a thorn hedge. Such men are not like Jesus. Let us seek to win others by the gentleness of our words and acts. The gospel is very loving. It is the message of the God of love to a lost and fallen race. Christ's last command to his disciples was, Love one another. Oh, for more real, hearty union and love to all the saints, for more tender compassion towards the souls of the worst and vilest of men. We must not forget that the gospel of Christ is holy. It never excuses sin, it pardons it, but only through an atonement. If our life is to resemble the gospel, we must shun not merely the grosser vices, but everything that would hinder our perfect conformity to Christ. For his sake, for our own sakes, and for the sakes of others, we must strive day by day to let our conversation be more in accordance with his gospel. Morning and Evening Devotional by Charles Haddon Spurgeon Morning, May 25th Psalm 38, verse 21 Do not forsake me, O Lord. Be not far from me, O my God. Frequently we pray that God would not forsake us in the hour of trial and temptation, but we too much forget that we have need to use this prayer at all times. There is no moment of our life, however holy, in which we can do without His constant upholding. Whether in light or in darkness, in communion or in temptation, we alike need the prayer. Forsake me not, O Lord. Hold thou me up, and I shall be safe. A little child, while learning to walk, always needs the nurse's aid. The ship, left by the pilot, drifts at once from her course. We cannot do without continued aid from above. Let it then be your prayer today. Forsake me not. Father, forsake not thy child, lest he fall by the hand of the enemy. Shepherd, forsake not thy lamb lest he wander from the safety of the fold. Great husbandman, forsake not thy plant, lest it wither and die. Forsake me not, O Lord, now, and forsake me not at any moment of my life. Forsake me not in my joys, lest they absorb my heart. Forsake me not in my sorrows, lest I murmur against thee. Forsake me not in the day of my repentance, lest I lose the hope of pardon and fall into despair. And forsake me not in the day of my strongest faith, lest faith degenerate into presumption. Forsake me not, for without thee I am weak, but with thee I am strong. Forsake me not, for my path is dangerous and full of snares, and I cannot do without thy guidance. The hen forsakes not her brood. Do thou then evermore cover me with thy feathers, and permit me under thy wings to find my refuge. Be not far from me, O Lord, for trouble is near, for there is none to help. Leave me not, neither forsake me, O God of my salvation. O, oh, ever in our cleansed breast, bid thine eternal spirit rest, and make our secret soul to be a temple pure and worthy thee. Morning and Evening Devotional by Charles Haddon Spurgeon Evening, May 25th Luke, chapter 24, verses 33 through 35 And they got up that very hour and returned to Jerusalem. There they found the eleven and those with them, gathered together and saying, 
the Lord has indeed risen and has appeared to Simon. Then the two told what had happened on the road and how they had recognized Jesus in the breaking of the bread. When the two disciples had reached Emmaus and were refreshing themselves at the evening meal, the mysterious stranger who had so enchanted them upon the road took bread and break it, made himself known to them, and then vanished out of their sight. They had constrained him to abide with them, because the day was far spent. But now, although it was much later, their love was a lamp to their feet, yea, wings also. They forgot the darkness, their weariness was all gone, and forthwith they journeyed back the threescore furlongs to tell the gladsome news of a risen Lord who had appeared to them by the way. They reached the Christians in Jerusalem and were received by a burst of joyful news before they could tell their own tale. These early Christians were all on fire to speak of Christ's resurrection and to proclaim what they knew of the Lord. They made common property of their experiences. This evening, let their example impress us deeply. We too must bear our witness concerning Jesus. John's account of the sepulcher needed to be supplemented by Peter, and Mary could speak of something further still. Combined, we have a full testimony from which nothing can be spared. We have each of us peculiar gifts and special manifestations, but the one object God has in view is the perfecting of the whole body of Christ. We must, therefore, bring our spiritual possessions and lay them at the apostles' feet and make distribution unto all of what God has given to us. Keep back no part of the precious truth, but speak what you know and testify what you have seen. Let not the toil or darkness or possible unbelief of your friends weigh one moment in the scale. Up and be marching to the place of duty and there tell what great things God has shown to your soul. Morning and Evening Devotional by Charles Haddon Spurgeon Morning, May 26th Psalm 55, verse 22 Cast your burden upon the Lord and He will sustain you. He will never let the righteous be shaken. Care, even though exercised upon legitimate objects, if carried to excess, has in it the nature of sin. The precept to avoid anxious care is earnestly inculcated by our Saviour again and again. It is reiterated by the apostles, and it is one which cannot be neglected without involving transgression. For the very essence of anxious care is the imagining that we are wiser than God, and the thrusting ourselves into His place to do for Him that which He has undertaken to do for us. We attempt to think of that which we fancy He will forget. We labor to take upon ourselves our weary burden as if He were unable or unwilling to take it for us. Now this disobedience to His plain precept, this unbelief in His word, this presumption in intruding upon His province, is all sinful. Yet more than this, anxious care often leads to acts of sin. He who cannot calmly leave his affairs in God's hand, but will carry his own burden, is very likely to be tempted to use wrong means to help himself. This sin leads to a forsaking of God as our counselor and resorting instead to human wisdom. This is going to the broken cistern instead of to the fountain, a sin which was laid against Israel of old. Anxiety makes us doubt God's loving kindness, and thus our love to Him grows cold. We feel mistrust, and thus grieve the Spirit of God, so that our prayers become hindered, our consistent example marred, and our life one of self-seeking. Thus, want of confidence in God leads us to wander far from Him. But if through simple faith in His promise, we cast each burden as it comes upon Him, and are careful for nothing, because He undertakes to care for us, it will keep us close to Him and strengthen us against much temptation. Thou wilt keep Him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on Thee, 
because he trusteth in thee. Morning and Evening Devotional by Charles Haddon Spurgeon Evening, May 26th Acts chapter 14, verse 22 Strengthening the souls of the disciples and encouraging them to continue in the faith, we must endure many hardships to enter the kingdom of God, they said. Perseverance is the badge of true saints. The Christian life is not a beginning only in the ways of God, but also a continuance in the same as long as life lasts. It is with a Christian as it was with the great Napoleon. He said, Conquest has made me what I am, and conquest must maintain me. So under God, dear brother in the Lord, conquest has made you what you are, and conquest must sustain you. Your motto must be Excelsior. He only is a true conqueror, and shall be crowned at the last, who continueth till war's trumpet is blown no more. Perseverance is, therefore, the target of all our spiritual enemies. The world does not object to your being a Christian for a time, if she can but tempt you to cease your pilgrimage and settle down to buy and sell with her in Vanity Fair. The flesh will seek to ensnare you and to prevent your pressing on to glory. It is weary work being a pilgrim. Come, give it up. Am I always to be mortified? Am I never to be indulged? Give me at least a furlough from this constant warfare. Satan will make many a fierce attack on your perseverance. It will be the mark for all his arrows. He will strive to hinder you in service. He will insinuate that you are doing no good and that you want rest. He will endeavor to make you weary of suffering. He will whisper, Curse God and die. Or he will attack your steadfastness. What is the good of being so zealous? Be quiet like the rest, sleep as do others, and let your lamp go out as the other virgins do. Or he will assail your doctrinal sentiments. Why do you hold to these denominational creeds? Sensible men are getting more liberal. They are removing the old landmarks. Fall in with the times. Wear your shield, Christian, therefore close upon your armor and cry mightily unto God that by his Spirit you may endure to the end. Morning and Evening Devotional by Charles Haddon Spurgeon Morning, May 27th 2 Samuel, chapter 9, verse 13 So Mephibosheth lived in Jerusalem because he always ate at the king's table and he was lame in both feet. Mephibosheth was no great ornament to a royal table, yet he had a continual place at David's board because the king could see in his face the features of the beloved Jonathan. Like Mephibosheth, we may cry unto the king of glory, What is thy servant that thou shouldst look upon such a dead dog as I am? But still the Lord indulges us with most familiar intercourse with himself because he sees in our countenances the remembrance of his dearly beloved Jesus. The Lord's people are dear for another's sake. Such is the love which the Father bears to his only begotten, that for his sake he raises his lowly brethren from poverty and banishment to courtly companionship, noble rank, and royal provision. Their deformity shall not rob them of their privileges, Lameness is no bar to sonship. The cripple is as much the heir as if he could run like Asahel. Our right does not limp, though our might may. A king's table is a noble hiding place for lame legs, and at the gospel feast we learn to glory in infirmities, because the power of Christ resteth upon us. Yet grievous disability may mar the persons of the best loved saints. Here is one feasted by David and yet so lame in both his feet that he could not go up with the king when he fled from the city and was therefore maligned and injured by his servant Ziba. Saints whose faith is weak and whose knowledge is slender are great losers. They are exposed to many enemies 
and cannot follow the king whithersoever he goeth. This disease frequently arises from falls. Bad nursing in their spiritual infancy often causes converts to fall into a despondency from which they never recover, and sin in other cases brings broken bones. Lord, help the lame to leap like an heart, and satisfy all thy people with the bread of that do. Morning and Evening Devotional by Charles Haddon Spurgeon Evening, May 27th 2 Samuel, chapter 9, verse 8 Mephibosheth bowed down and said, What is your servant that you should show regard for a dead dog like me? If Mephibosheth was thus humbled by David's kindness, what shall we be in the presence of our gracious Lord? The more grace we have, the less we shall think of ourselves, for grace, like light, reveals our impurity. Eminent saints have scarcely known to what to compare themselves. Their sense of unworthiness has been so clear and keen. I am, says Holy Rutherford, a dry and withered branch, a piece of dead carcass, dry bones, and not able to step over a straw. In another place he writes, Except as to open outbreakings, I want nothing of what Judas and Cain had. The meanest objects in nature appear to the humbled mind to have a preference above itself, because they have never contracted sin. A dog may be greedy, fierce, or filthy, but it has no conscience to violate, no holy spirit to resist. A dog may be a worthless animal, and yet by a little kindness it is soon one to love its master and is faithful unto death. But we forget the goodness of the Lord, and follow not at his call. The term dead dog is the most expressive of all terms of contempt, but it is none too strong to express the self-abhorrence of instructed believers. They do not affect mock modesty. They mean what they say. They have weighed themselves in the balances of the sanctuary, and found out the vanity of their nature. At best, we are but clay, animated dust, mere walking hillocks. But viewed as sinners, we are monsters indeed. Let it be published in heaven as a wonder that the Lord Jesus should set his heart's love upon such as we are. Dust and ashes though we be, we must and will magnify the exceeding greatness of his grace. Could not his heart find rest in heaven? Must he needs come to these tents of Kedar for a spouse, and choose a bride upon whom the sun had looked? O oh, heavens and earth, break forth into a song, and give all glory to our sweet Lord Jesus. Morning and Evening Devotional by Charles Haddon Spurgeon Morning, May 28th Romans chapter 8, verse 30 and those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. Here is a precious truth for thee, believer. Thou mayest be poor, or in suffering, or unknown. But for thine encouragement, take a review of thy calling and the consequences that flow from it, and especially that blessed result here spoken of. As surely as thou art God's child today, so surely shall all thy trials soon be at an end, and thou shalt be rich to all the intents of bliss. Wait a while, and that weary head shall wear the crown of glory, and that hand of labor shall grasp the palm branch of victory. Lament not thy troubles, but rather rejoice that ere long thou wilt be where there shall be neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain. The chariots of fire are at thy door, and a moment will suffice to bear thee to the glorified. The everlasting song is almost on thy lip. The portals of heaven stand open for thee. Think not that thou canst fail of entering into rest. If he hath called thee, nothing can divide thee from his love. Distress cannot sever the bond. The fire of persecution cannot burn the link. The hammer of hell cannot break the chain. Thou art secure. That voice, which called thee at first, 
shall call thee yet again from earth to heaven, from death's dark gloom to immortality's unuttered splendors. Rest assured, the heart of him who has justified thee beats with infinite love towards thee. Thou shalt soon be with the glorified, where thy portion is. Thou art only waiting here to be made meet for the inheritance, and that done, the wings of angels shall waft thee far away, to the mount of peace and joy and blessedness, where, far from a world of grief and sin, with God eternally shut in, thou shalt rest forever and ever. Morning and Evening Devotional by Charles Haddon Spurgeon Evening, May 28th Lamentations, Chapter 3, Verse 21 Yet I call this to mind, and therefore I have hope. Memory is frequently the bond-slave of despondency. Despairing minds call to remembrance every dark foreboding in the past, and dilate upon every gloomy feature in the present. Thus memory, clothed in sackcloth, presents to the mind a cup of mingled gall and wormwood. There is, however, no necessity for this. Wisdom can readily transform memory into an angel of comfort. That same recollection which in its left hand brings so many gloomy omens may be trained to bear in its right a wealth of hopeful signs. She need not wear a crown of iron. She may encircle her brow with a fillet of gold, all spangled with stars. Thus it was in Jeremiah's experience. In the previous verse, Memory had brought him to deep humiliation of soul. My soul hath them still in remembrance, and is humbled in me. And now this same memory restored him to life and comfort. This I recall to my mind, therefore have I hope. Like a two-edged sword, his memory first killed his pride with one edge, and then slew his despair with the other. As a general principle, if we would exercise our memories more wisely, we might, in our very darkest distress, strike a match which would instantaneously kindle the lamp of comfort. There is no need for God to create a new thing upon the earth in order to restore believers to joy. If they would prayerfully rake the ashes of the past, they would find light for the present. And if they would turn to the Book of Truth, and the throne of grace, their candle would soon shine as aforetime. Be it ours to remember the loving kindness of the Lord, and to rehearse his deeds of grace. Let us open the volume of recollection which is so richly illuminated with memorials of mercy, and we shall soon be happy. Thus memory may be, as Coleridge calls it, the bosom spring of joy. And when the divine comforter bends it to his service, it may be chief among earthly comforters. Morning and Evening Devotional by Charles Haddon Spurgeon Morning, May 29th Psalm 45, verse 7 You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness, therefore God, your God, has anointed you above your companions with the oil of joy. Be ye angry, and sin not. There can hardly be goodness in a man if he be not angry at sin. He who loves truth must hate every false way. How our Lord Jesus hated it when the temptation came. Thrice it assailed him in the different forms, but ever he met it with, Get thee behind me, Satan. He hated it in others, none the less fervently, because he showed his hate oftener in tears of pity than in words of rebuke. Yet what language could be more stern, more Elijah-like, than the words, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye devour widows' houses, and for a pretense make long prayer. He hated wickedness, so much that he bled to wound it to the heart. He died that it might die. He was buried that he might bury it in his tomb and he rose that he might forever trample it beneath his feet. Christ is in the gospel, and that gospel is opposed to wickedness in every shape. Wickedness 
arrays itself in fair garments, and imitates the language of holiness. But the precepts of Jesus, like his famous scourge of small cords, chase it out of the temple and will not tolerate it in the church. So, too, in the heart where Jesus reigns, what war there is between Christ and Belial. And when our Redeemer shall come to be our judge, those thundering words, Depart ye cursed, which are indeed but a prolongation of his life teaching concerning sin, shall manifest his abhorrence of iniquity. As warm as is his love to sinners, so hot is his hatred of sin, as perfect as is his righteousness, so complete shall be the destruction of every form of wickedness. O thou glorious champion of right and destroyer of wrong, for this cause hath God, even thy God, anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. Morning and Evening Devotional by Charles Haddon Spurgeon Evening, May 29th Joshua chapter 6, verse 26 At that time Joshua invoked this solemn oath, Cursed before the Lord is the man who rises up and rebuilds the city Jericho. At the cost of his firstborn, he will lay its foundations. At the cost of his youngest, he will set up its gates. Since he was cursed who rebuilt Jericho, much more the man who labors to restore popery among us. In our father's days, the gigantic walls of popery fell by the power of their faith, the perseverance of their efforts, and the blast of their gospel trumpets. And now there are some who would rebuild that accursed system upon its old foundation. O oh Lord, be pleased to thwart their unrighteous endeavors and pull down every stone which they build. It should be a serious business with us to be thoroughly purged of every error which may have a tendency to foster the spirit of popery. And when we have made a clean sweep at home, we should seek in every way to oppose its all too rapid spread abroad, in the church and in the world. This last can be done in secret by fervent prayer, and in public by decided testimony. We must warn with judicious boldness those who are inclined towards the errors of Rome. We must instruct the young in gospel truth and tell them of the black doings of popery in the olden times. We must aid in spreading the light more thoroughly through the land, for priests, like owls, hate daylight. Are we doing all we can for Jesus and the gospel? If not, our negligence plays into the hands of the priestcraft. What are we doing to spread the Bible, which is the Pope's bane and poison? Are we casting abroad good, sound gospel writings? Luther once said, The devil hates goose quills, and doubtless he has good reason for ready writers, by the Holy Spirit's blessing, have done his kingdom much damage. If the thousands who will read this short word this night will do all they can to hinder the rebuilding of this accursed Jericho, the Lord's glory shall speed among the sons of men. Reader, what can you do? What will you do? Morning and Evening Devotional by Charles Haddon Spurgeon Morning, May 30th Song of Solomon Chapter 2, verse 15 Catch for us the foxes, the little foxes that ruin the vineyards, for our vineyards are in bloom. A little thorn may cause much suffering. A little cloud may hide the sun. Little foxes spoil the vines, and little sins do mischief to the tender heart. These little sins burrow in the soul, and make it so full of that which is hateful to Christ, that he will hold no comfortable fellowship and communion with us. A great sin cannot destroy a Christian, but a little sin can make him miserable. Jesus will not walk with his people unless they drive out every known sin. He says, If ye keep my commandments, 
ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. Some Christians very seldom enjoy their Saviour's presence. How is this? Surely it must be an affliction for a tender child to be separated from his father. Art thou a child of God, and yet satisfied to go on without seeing thy father's face? What, thou the spouse of Christ, and yet content without his company? Surely thou hast fallen into a sad state, for the chaste spouse of Christ mourns like a dove without her mate when he has left her. Ask then the question, What has driven Christ from thee? He hides his face behind the wall of thy sins. That wall may be built up of little pebbles as easily as of great stones. The sea is made of drops, the rocks are made of grains, and the sea which divides thee from Christ may be filled with the drops of thy little sins, and the rock which has well nigh wrecked thy bark may have been made by the daily working of the coral insects of thy little sins. If thou wouldst live with Christ, and walk with Christ, and see Christ, and have fellowship with Christ, take heed of the little foxes that spoil the vines, for our vines have tender grapes. Jesus invites you to go with him and take them. He will surely, like Samson, take the foxes at once, and easily. Go with him to the hunting. Morning and Evening Devotional by Charles Haddon Spurgeon Evening, May 30th Romans chapter 6, verse 6 We know that our old self was crucified with him, so that the body of sin might be rendered powerless, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. Christian. What hast thou to do with sin? Hath it not cost thee enough already? Burnt child, wilt thou play with the fire? What? When thou hast already been between the jaws of the lion, wilt thou step a second time into his den? Hast thou not had enough of the old serpent? Did he not poison all thy veins once? And wilt thou play upon the hole of the asp? and put thy hand upon the cockatrice's den a second time. Oh, be not so mad, so foolish! Did sin ever yield thee real pleasure? Didst thou find solid satisfaction in it? If so, go back to thine old drudgery, and wear the chain again, if it delight thee. But inasmuch as sin did never give thee what it promised to bestow, but deluded thee with lies, be not a second time snared by the old fowler. Be free, and let the remembrance of thy ancient bondage forbid thee to enter the net again. It is contrary to the designs of eternal love, which all have an eye to thy purity and holiness. Therefore, run not counter to the purposes of thy Lord. Another thought should restrain thee from sin. Christians can never sin cheaply. They pay a heavy price for iniquity. Transgression destroys peace of mind, obscures fellowship with Jesus, hinders prayer, brings darkness over the soul. Therefore be not the serf and bondman of sin. There is yet a higher argument. Each time you serve sin, you have crucified the Lord afresh and put him to an open shame. Can you bear that thought? Oh, if you have fallen into any special sin during this day, it may be my master has sent this admonition this evening to bring you back before you have backslidden very far. Turn thee to Jesus anew. He has not forgotten his love to thee. His grace is still the same. With weeping and repentance come thou to his footstool, and thou shalt be once more received into his heart. Thou shalt be set upon a rock again, and thy goings shall be established. Morning and Evening Devotional by Charles Haddon Spurgeon Morning, May 31st 2 Samuel, chapter 15, verse 23 Everyone in the countryside was weeping loudly as all the people passed by. 
and as the king crossed the Kidron Valley, all the people also passed toward the way of the wilderness. David passed that gloomy brook when flying with his mourning company from his traitor son. The man after God's own heart was not exempt from trouble. Nay, his life was full of it. He was both the Lord's anointed and the Lord's afflicted. Why then should we expect to escape? At sorrow's gates, the noblest of our race have waited with ashes on their heads. Wherefore then should we complain? as though some strange thing had happened unto us. The king of kings himself was not favoured with a more cheerful or royal road. He passed over the filthy ditch of Kidron, through which the filth of Jerusalem flowed. God had one son without sin, but not a single child without the rod. It is a great joy to believe that Jesus has been tempted in all points like as we are. What is our Kidron this morning? Is it a faithless friend, a sad bereavement, a slanderous reproach, a dark foreboding? The king has passed over all these. Is it bodily pain, poverty, persecution, or contempt? Over each of these Kidrons the king has gone before us. In all our afflictions he was afflicted. The idea of strangeness in our trials must be banished at once and forever, for he who is the head of all saints knows by experience the grief which we think so peculiar. All the citizens of Zion must be free of the honourable company of mourners, of which the Prince Emmanuel is head and captain. Notwithstanding the abasement of David, he yet returned in triumph to his city, and David's Lord arose victorious from the grave. Let us then be of good courage, for we also shall win the day. We shall yet with joy draw water out of the wells of salvation, though now for a season we have to pass by the noxious streams of sin and sorrow. Courage, soldiers of the cross, the king himself triumphed after going over Kidron, and so shall you. Morning and Evening Devotional by Charles Haddon Spurgeon Evening, May 31st Psalm 103, verse 3 He who forgives all your iniquities and heals all your diseases. Humbling as is the statement, yet the fact is certain, that we are all more or less suffering under the disease of sin. What a comfort to know that we have a great physician who is both able and willing to heal us. Let us think of him a while tonight. His cures are very speedy. There is life in a look at him. His cures are radical. He strikes at the center of the disease, and hence his cures are sure and certain. He never fails, and the disease never returns. There is no relapse where Christ heals, no fear that his patients should be merely patched up for a season. He makes new men of them. A new heart also does he give them, and a right spirit does he put within them. He is well skilled in all diseases. Physicians generally have some speciality. Although they may know a little about almost all our pains and ills, there is usually one disease which they have studied above all others. But Jesus Christ is thoroughly acquainted with the whole of human nature. He is as much at home with one sinner as with another. And never yet did he meet with an out-of-the-way case that was difficult to him. He has had extraordinary complications of strange diseases to deal with, but he has known exactly with one glance of his eye how to treat the patient. He is the only universal doctor, and the medicine he gives is the only true Catholicon, healing in every instance. Whatever our spiritual malady may be, we should apply at once to this divine physician. There is no brokenness of heart which Jesus cannot bind up. His blood cleanseth from all sin. We have but to think of the myriads who have been delivered from all sorts of diseases through the power and virtue of his touch, and we shall joyfully put ourselves in his hands. We trust him, and sin dies. We love him, and grace lives. We wait for him and grace is strengthened, 
we see him as he is, and grace is perfected forever.